history of the Czech lands and of Sweden became intertwined in the course of the Thirty Years' War. In the whirl of this conflict, which in the first half of the 17th century had an enormous impact of Europe's development. This war began and also ended, from the point of view of military operations at least, within the Czech lands. The uprising of the Czech establishment against the Emperor began at the onset of the war. The war grew to an extensive conflict after the rebels had thrown imperial governors out of the windows of Prague Castle on May 23, 1618. They then chose Frederick the Palatine Elector as the new king. In no time a war flared up, vexing Europe for over 30 years. In its initial phase, in the so-called Czech War, the fights occurred especially in the territories of Bohemia, Moravia, Austria and the Hungarian lands. In the course of these fights, the rebels even succeeded in endangering Vienna, the residential city of the Emperor. The luck of war turned its back upon the insurgents definitively in 1620, when the Imperial Army invaded Bohemia together with the Catholic League Army. The last act of the Czech War was the Battle of White Mountain. The army of the rebellious establishment suffered defeat and left Prague. Frederick of the Palatine, the king, fled the country too. Over 27 leaders of the uprising were arrested and were executed in Old Town Square in Prague. Frederick of the Palatine, the king chosen by the insurgents, then defended successfully his ancestral lands in the so-called Palatine War. Afterwards, the anti-Hapsburg front was strengthened by the Danish king Christian IV. The Danish war began in 1625 and lasted until 1629. The Danish king lost and the army of Albert of Wallenstein, a general of the emperor, appeared on the Baltic coast and thus started to directly threaten the power interests of Sweden. Then, in 1630, the Swedish king, Gustafus Adolf, laid his sword on the scale of fortune. This was the beginning of the Swedish War, which devastated extensive regions of Germany. The Swedish sovereign himself was killed in this war in the Battle of Lutzen in 1632. However, the Swedish Chancellor Oxenstierna succeeded in renewing the anti-Habsburg coalition in 1633 and the war thus continued. This phase ended only in 1635 by the so-called Peace of Prague. However, none of the antagonists considered it a definitive end to the fighting. In April 1635, the Swedish French alliance was confirmed by a charter and in no time the war flared up with renewed strength. The longest and bloodiest stage of the Thirty Year Conflict had begun, the Swedish-French War. During this phase the greatest number of battles took place. Bohemia and Moravia became battlefields several times then, with the Swedish armies entering their territories during their military operations. The first time it happened was in 1639 during the offensive of General Banner. His divisions invaded Bohemia from Saxony and gained control over areas along an important transportation route, the Elbe River, all the way to the town of Brandis nad Laban. During this campaign, Banner even twice directly endangered the capital of the kingdom, Prague. 
The Swedish army was then concentrated between Little Meritza, Melnik and Bandis and launched sallies from there deep into enemy territory. The campaign of Banner represents perhaps the most severe disaster for the Czech Republic. According to the sources, over 6,000 towns and villages were burnt out and plundered. The Czech lands were again transformed into battlefields in 1642. They were chosen as the target of operations by General Lennart Torstenson. Moravia suffered the most, where the Swedes conquered several strongholds, out of which Olomouc became the most significant one. One year later, the divisions of Torstenson operated in Bohemia, from where they moved to Moravia again. However, they did not succeed in provoking the Imperial Army into a battle. Therefore, they started to pull back through northern Moravia to Silesia. During this campaign, the Swedish army strengthened the network of strongholds in Moravia, where the garrisons remained. One such fortress was Sovinets, a castle of the Order of Teutonic Knights. It was besieged by the Swedish divisions under the personal command of Torstenson for 33 days. Afterwards, the garrison of the fortress greatly damaged by a cannonade, capitulated with the promise of escaping unharmed. The castle remained a Swedish stronghold until the end of the war, and the Swedish garrison left it only after fulfilment of the conditions of peace in 1650. The whole of Central Europe was in a miserable shape and exhausted by the war. Therefore, in 1644, efforts to end the conflict were intensified. Preliminary peace talks were held in the towns of Westphalia, Munster and Osnabrück. Meanwhile, military operations were not quieting down. Bloody clashes occurred with the goal of improving the negotiation positions of individual participants of the conflict. For example, General Torstensen began a new campaign in the Czech lands. In the course of this campaign, the bloodiest battle of the Thirty Years' War was fought at Jankov, not far from Benishov, central Bohemia. In this battle, on March 6, 1645, the Swedes smashed the Imperial Army. Here they also seized the flags of many Imperial units, uh, and they still can be found in the collections of the Military Museum in Stockholm. After the battle at Jankov, Torstenson proceeded to Yilhava, which he occupied on March 11th, 1645. Then he moved to Zenoimo, and from there to Austria, where he tried to cross the Danube and attack Vienna. In respect to the fact that he did not have enough forces to besiege the city, and that military help promised was not coming, the Swedish general moved with his army back to Moravia, to the town of Bruno. He enveloped this on May the 4th and May the 5th, 1645. The town defended itself heroically, led by Colonel Radwe de Souche. The last attempt to conquer Bruno was an attack on August the 15th, 1645, and it was warded off by the defenders. Therefore, Torstenson moved out of Moravia with his rather depleted and tired army on August the 23rd, 1645. In the following year, the Swedish garrisons held some conquered fortified points in the territories of Bohemia and Moravia. The Imperial Army struggled to force them out of such places gradually. In this year, the Czech lands were saved from large-scale operations. The fights were held especially in Germany and Silesia. In the middle of February 1647, several hundred Swedish cavalrymen broke into Bohemia, which the Swedish general Axel Lillian invaded shortly afterwards. His divisions performed raids as far as the vicinity of Pilsen. In Moravia, the Olomutz garrison was supplied from Silesia by the units of General Avrid Wittenberg. In June 1647, General Wangel appeared near Hepp. 
and he laid siege to the town on June 24th. Hebb capitulated on July 17th and thanks to this the Swedes gained rich reserves of food and arms. One month later, Swedish forces met the Imperial Army at Trebel, where they suffered a defeat on August 21st, 1647. In this battle, young Hemel Rangor also died. In Moravia, the situation of the Swedish garrisons located there was worsening. Already on February the 7th, 1647, Desouches laid siege to Yulava. On May 30th, he enveloped it completely upon arrival of reinforcements. However, he did not succeed. Upon the defeat of the Swedish army at Trebel and their being forced from Bohemia, it was clear that no one would come to help the Swedes in Yelava. The Imperial army renewed its siege and after a tough fight in which the commander of the garrison under siege, Samuel Osterling, was killed. The Swedish army capitulated on December 7, 1647 in exchange for a promise that they could leave unharmed. While negotiations were taking place in the distant Westphalian towns of Munster and Osnabrück between warring factions for a third year already in 1648. The Swedish army invaded Bohemia again and it was even preparing to attack the capital of the kingdom, Prague. The general John Christopher Konigsmark marched into Bohemia and through Pilsen. He was aiming for Rakovnik which he occupied on July the 24th, 1648. From there, he sent a fast hit squad of 300 men to Prague, led by Otto Walski, an imperial officer who had deserted to join the other side. At that time, a garrison commanded by Count Rudolf Colorido was in Prague. The town walls were damaged and only partially repaired and modernized. However, the determined defenders defended them for a relatively long time. With the prospect of peace, time was short. If the Swedes wanted the rich prizes offered in Prague, they would have to act quickly. Therefore, their hopes of occupying the town lay with Otto Walski, the deserter. He knew the weak points of the defence and thus led the Swedes with certainty. At midnight on July the 26th, 1648, their division stood ready and not noticed by anyone at the Vesda Chateau on the White Mountain. At half past two in the morning, they moved close to the walls in the section between Loretta and the Brzevnov Monastery. Here the city walls were not only damaged but also poorly guarded. The attackers dealt with it successfully, conquered the guards and then fell on the Strahov gate from the rear, thus enabling the main forces of the Swedish army to enter the town. Even Malastrana and Hajani fell into the hands of the Swedish divisions. The prize was unprecedented. They seized the huge treasure of Count Schlick stored in the Strahov Monastery, as well as the property of the town commander, Colorido. The commander escaped at the last moment, dressed only in his nightgown, and crossed the river in a boat into unoccupied parts of Prague. Reportedly, the Swedes gained 12 million gold coins in plunder. They captured over 180 distinguished personages. Precious collections gathered formerly by the Emperor Rodolf II at Prague Castle were declared by the General Konigsmark as a state prize. Thanks to this, many art treasures found their way to Sweden. If the Swedes relied on being welcomed in Prague as liberators from the hateful Habsburg yoke, as they had been assured all the time by the Czech immigrants led by Jan Amos Komensky, then they were strongly disappointed. Prague citizens were ready to defend their town, and moreover, in the course of the 30 years which had lapsed since the uprising of the establishment, a new Catholic generation grew here.
The Count Colorado organized defense of the right bank part of Prague. Citizen militias were activated and the Student Legion entered the field. This consisted of 750 students from Prague University. Another Swedish army was approaching from Podibadi, led by Count Wittenberg. On July 31st it stood in front of Prague and on August the 3rd and 4th it commenced an artillery attack from the east. The artillery of Konigsmark joined them from Malastrana and many houses were damaged. The town could not counter the attack in the same manner for the defenders did not have enough cannons. However, Wittenberg did not resolve to perform a direct attack. When he saw the town was defending itself, he moved to southern Bohemia. There his soldiers conquered the town of Tabor, and from there they attacked Austria. Besieged Prague could rest for several weeks and make provisional repairs of the town walls. At the end of September, Wittenberg's army returned to Prague, and another Swedish army arrived there with him. This was led by Charles Gustavus, successor to the Swedish throne. On October the 6th, an attack on the town by all three of the Swedish armies was held. However, true hell was unleashed on October the 10th and 11th. But still, Prague citizens defended themselves for the time being. On October 24th, the peace treaty was finally signed in Munster. In Prague, however, this was not known by the aggressors or the besieged. As a paradox, on this very day, Charles Gustavus received a command to perform another, the fourth, great attack on the town. Supported by the artillery, the Swedes struggled to break through the town walls. The greatest fights concerned the Horska Gate. The morale in town crumbled because the gunpowder reserves were running short. Therefore, the Count Colorido started to negotiate an armistice. However, on November the 1st, 1648, Charles Gustavus received the message that peace had been reached, and he ordered his divisions to move back to Rajani and Malastrana. One day later, the besieged town learned about the peace as well. Upon the successful defense of Prague, Emperor Ferdinand III confirmed all privileges to the old and new towns. He even reformed their city emblem. The armoured arm with a sword defending an open gate, as can still be seen on the coat of arms of Prague. This appeared in the emblem in 1649 for the first time as a very expression of the Emperor's gratitude for the heroic defence against the Swedes. <laughs>